The UK is about to go through one of the biggest political shakeups in over a decade, and it's got UK investors concerned about what's to come for their investment portfolios. Could there be restrictions on ISA allowances and pensions, and could we see continued underperformance for the UK's biggest companies? Or will we see a turn for the better? I sure hope so, but at this point, we haven't really heard all too much from the major political parties around pensions, savings and investments. Today, I'm going to be doing an explainer on Labour's policy for our country's future. Instead, they've spent most of their time bickering on national television like school kids. We're going to hear okay. a lot about the past yeah. in this election, well, but this election is about years. the future. So we'll have to make some of the assumptions for ourselves. And before we dive into the future, like Rishi Sunak talks about, first we must look at the current state of affairs because looking at where we are right now and the direction that we've been heading in will kind of give us somewhat more of an insight into the direction we're going to set sail in in the future. The three major political issues right now all seem to be around tax, the NHS and immigration. We've obviously heard lots of other political talking points, but one thing that we haven't heard of is the outlook for the retail investing community moving forwards. From what I've seen, there's no reference to it in any of the manifestos that have been made public. But let's be honest, the current policies that are in play aren't exactly geared towards encouraging people of the UK to invest in UK financial markets. Let's discuss a handful of examples. First up, we've got the dividend tax allowance. The UK stock market is very well known for paying good dividends. In actual fact, it's one of the reasons why investors in the UK actually invest into the UK stock market. To give you an example, the Vanguard FTSE 100 ETF currently pays 3.29% and the Vanguard FTSE 250 ETF pays 3.19%. Now a dividend simplistically is the distributed profits from a company to all of their shareholders. But over the last six years or so, that tax-free dividend allowance has been slashed by 90% from £5,000 back in 2018 to just £500 as at this current tax year. To provide some more context, in order to earn £500 a year in dividends, you would need to invest in something like the Vanguard FTSE 100 ETF, paying that 3.29%, and you'd have to have roughly about £15,000 invested into that fund. After that, you would be paying dividend tax on every pound of dividends that you received, the tax man, unless it's in a stocks and shares ISA account, which we'll touch on in just a moment's time. To give you an insight as to what those dividend tax rates are, well, they're kind of aligned to your income tax rate. So if you're a basic rate income taxpayer paying 20%, you would pay a dividend tax rate of 8.75%. If you're a higher rate taxpayer, it's 33.75%. And if you're an additional rate taxpayer, it's 39.35% in dividend tax. I don't know about you, but that doesn't exactly encourage retail investors to invest in the UK market specifically. And I'm kind of purposely going to ignore the angle of directors of limited companies pulling out dividends tax free for their own benefit, because that's probably another topic for another day. But one thing I will say with all of the other risks and tax burdens that small business owners have, which are also the backbone of the UK economy, then surely there should be a little bit more encouragement and aspiration for people to become entrepreneurs and build up their own businesses to support the economy, increase GDP, along with reduce unemployment rates too. And the way we're currently set up from a tax perspective doesn't exactly inspire that ambition. Next up, we have capital gains tax. This is a tax that's charged upon the sale of an asset. And again, we're going to look at this through the perspective of a retail investor's lens, and we're going to ignore other things that are related to capital gains tax like property as well as business asset disposals too. Now, similar to the dividends allowance story, capital gains tax allowance is also quite similar. Back in 2016, all UK residents had a capital gains tax-free allowance of £11,100, but this has been reduced by 73% to just £3,000 as at this current tax year. This means if you bought £5,000 worth of stock in a company like Nvidia over the past 12 months at 40 quid a share, meaning you bought 125 shares, and then you went on to benefit from the 205% rally that we've seen in the past 12 months, then today you'd be sat on unrealized profits of roughly £10,625. If you were to sell that position today, you would be taxed on the proceeds, which are 7,625 quid. Those tax rates being 10% if you're a basic rate tax, taxpayer, so £726.50, or 20% if you're a higher rate taxpayer, which would be the equivalent to £1,453. It's absolute garbage. Now, let's be honest, in an ideal world, we'd all like to pay as little tax as humanly possible. Me? I'm not paying. On the one hand, we have the political parties talking about the future aspirations of the UK, even the likes of Jeremy Hunt talking about kind of the aspiration to have more people invest into UK markets. 
And whilst that aspiration appears to be there, on the flip side, if you do do well from investing, you're kind of punished for it. For me, the bigger question here is what is the incentive? Because when you're hit from a dividend tax perspective and a capital gains tax perspective from investing outside of a tax incentivized account, it doesn't really make sense. But there's more. One thing that might be slightly overlooked is that you actually have to pay stamp duty on all UK share transactions. Let me give you guys an example. If I pull up my trading two on two app, you'll be able to see if we just scroll and find uh, UK companies. So let's just pick Rolls Royce for the purpose of example. If I click buy, let's just say we're going to pick up 10 shares in the company for just under 50 quid. You'll see in the fee structure that there is stamp duty charges of 23 pence. The math on that is a 0.5% charge for placing an order to buy shares in the UK stock. Now, when investment returns haven't exactly been abundant for UK markets, with Rolls Royce being the exception, being on a massive flurry over the course of the past 12 months. Again, it's another tax penalty for aspiring investors who are looking to increase their wealth. Now, I'm sure that works out to be a pretty penny on Rishi's bottom line when he looks at his tax revenue at the end of the year, but to me, it feels quite illogical. Maybe someone can educate me down in the comments section, but we only pay stamp duty on UK share transactions if we were to invest in US stocks or European stocks, that stamp duty charge doesn't actually apply. So again, where's the encouragement to invest domestically when it can be cheaper to invest internationally? Now you may be thinking, well, 0.5% is kind of nothing. I'm not all too fussed about paying such a little charge for buying shares in a company. But here's the important bit. When you add that 0.5% charge to say a 0.15% account fee, which someone like Vanguard will charge you, who admittedly are on the lower end of account fee structures, along with kind of an average fee cost of 0.2%, along with a number of other fees which can usually be layered into share transactions, that's a 0.85% fee at the very basic level. If you So for me, I think there has to be some big changes to encourage UK investors to invest not just in UK markets, but international markets too, in order to grow their wealth over the long term. The biggest companies on the planet are also the biggest wealth creators, so being encouraged to invest in them to me seems really important. Now, as I briefly touched upon, you can protect yourself from both these dividend tax rates and capital gains tax rates from investing into a tax incentivized account, also known as a stocks and shares ISA. It's where you can invest up to £20,000 per tax year without paying any tax whatsoever at any point in time. Now, one of the proposed solutions from the UK government to encourage UK investors to invest in UK markets is something called the British ISA. It was something that was announced back in the spring statement by Jeremy Hunt. And as far as I've read, it's a UK based investment account where you can only invest in UK equities and for doing that, they'll increase your ISA allowance from £20,000 to £25,000. Now, again, just my opinion, but I just feel like this is stupid. It just complicates things for newer investors who already have a ton of different account options with a ton of different providers. And instead, I would just propose that they increase the current £20,000 tax-free allowance to £25,000 instead, because it's been stuck there for the best part of the past six or seven years. And in actual fact, if you account for inflation over the course of the past six or seven years, then that ISA allowance should be about £25,000 a year anyway. So Jezza, if you're watching, scrap your British ISA and just increase the overall ISA allowance from £20,000 to £25,000 a year, because it will keep things simple and still encourage people to invest. Overall, my views are that we need to massively simplify investing, the investing products, the investing accounts, and the overall fees that are being charged. We also need to encourage people to have the appetite to invest too, through proper tax incentives, along with proper education in schools. But be sure to let me know what your thoughts are down in the comment section below. So that's the policy stuff. When it's all said and done on the 4th of July, what could actually happen to the UK stock market? And how will UK investors be impacted? Well, let's take a little bit of a deeper dive at the history of UK general elections and how they've affected the UK financial markets in the past. And to be honest, when I did the research, I was fairly surprised at the results. There have been a couple of studies done, one from the Royal Bank of Canada and one randomly from the University of Plymouth, but both of them came to the same kind of conclusions. They found, and I quote, the percentage of positive returns in the FTSE 100 three months before an election was 56%. During an election, the FTSE 100 had positive returns 67% of the time. And in the three months after an election, the UK's blue chip index posted positive returns 56% of the time. So generally speaking, the period in and around election times typically warrants more positive days for the UK stock market than negative 
which is obviously good for UK investors. I think I was kind of of the perception that whenever we kind of see change, this could cause some level of instability, which could rock the stock market. But actually, it very much appears quite the opposite from the UK investors' perspective. And perhaps that's because a lot of the UK companies that are listed on the FTSE 100 don't actually generate all of their revenue from the UK economy. And actually, a huge majority of them generate all of their income from international trade. So because of that, the political landscape here in the UK doesn't really affect the overall value of the companies that are listed on the London Stock Exchange because they're more international in nature. And look, from a macro level, we can see this very much in practice when we look at a chart of the FTSE 100 since its inception in 1984. And throughout that time, we've had nine different prime ministers, seven from the Conservative Party and two from Labour. Although we have had three from Conservative in the past two years, which kind of skews the numbers a little bit. A couple of them with questionable actions and some of them not really knowing what they're talking about. The HMP Pentonville last week, they've now got patrol dogs who are barking, which helps deter drones. So we're using all kinds of solutions to deal with. But regardless of what political party has been in power, generally speaking, over the long run, returns have been positive for UK investors. So with that said, my two takeaways from this piece of research are as follows. One, the UK government still have some work to do to simplify the retail investing landscape and encourage UK investors to actually want to invest in UK equities. And number two, it doesn't really matter which political party comes into power next, the FTSE 100 over the long run does provide positive returns. Albeit, I do have a preference to actually invest elsewhere, which perhaps at a more macro level is also part of the problem. Now, if you do want to know where I personally invest my money, well, I recently made an investment portfolio update revealing my full £165,000 investment portfolio, which you can check out in this video next. But before you go, be sure to subscribe to the channel. With that being said, I'll see you over in the next one.